Afternoon all. Now logically uh, we'll be looking at the last decisive game in the Anakin Bogolodzibov uh, match. Uh, we'll come to that. We'll first look at this game actually which Alexander Anakin played against someone called um, Book. Hero in our book in Margate 1938. Um, it's caught my interest actually because it's actually the first game I think mentioned by Alexander Kotov in his book on Alexander Anakin. And Kotov was trying to demonstrate actually, well he made three uh, generalizations about Alexander's play um, and how his style of play in particular. Uh, and the three generalizations included universality, uh, you know, being able to play e4 and d4, uh, and even knight f3, which is like Retti's opening, of course. And as black, he employed um, many different defenses as well against both e4 and d4, Sicilian, French, Alakai defense, Karakhan. So he, you know, is very diverse in in the openings. Um, you know, later actually that kind of changed didn't it with Fisher specializing uh, in certain lines the Sicilian for example dramatically had a very narrow repertoire but Alakine had a massively wide uh, repertoire so that's universality uh, secondly uh, as black striving for counter attacks not just being content to sit solid and trying for a draw so as black often playing um, uh, with the Shigurin principle uh, Kotov uh, emphasizes that Sh Shigurin the previous like father of of the Soviet chess school would also strive for counter attack in the openings. Uh, so mentions other kind of defense, Nimitzovic defense, Groomfield defense. Of course, Groomfield is is experiencing a resurgence in popularity. You know, Peter Zvidler is having amazing success with the Groomfield defense recently. Kasparov, of course, boosted its popularity when he used it effectively against Anatoly Karpov. Um, the third general thing which Kotov uh, mentions is the concrete solution of opening problems. Um, so basically, uh, although he, al he always followed the general rules and precepts of the openings, um, he, he associated um, them closely with a specific situation on the board. And sometimes he would totally, you know, smash people out of the opening, not just gain an opening advantage, but they'd be lost, you know, virtually straight out of the opening. And here's a, the dramatic game example, um, which also actually demonstrates some other Alakai not so nice traits, apparently, that uh, Book was an assiduous guy, <laughs> and he spent like a day doing analysis of this game, and some of the analysis crept it in its way in, into one of Alakai's books on the tournaments where he didn't actually see this analysis, it was from a book and maybe it wasn't credited. That's how the story goes anyway on ChessGamesCom around this game. If you want to check this game on ChessGamesCom. Um, but for, from the evolution of of Soviet chess style, let's, let's forget the broader general world chess style. From the Soviet chess school perspective, um, I find all these uh, influences very interesting, and especially Alexander Kotov, who many of you know on on the on this YouTube channel, I have expressed a deep hatred, resentment, as though Kotov's think like a grandmaster book about pure you know calculation, the science and the logic of chess, uh, seem to come uh, emphasizing the cold iceberg of chess, but not the hot fiery passion of chess, and you see the complete opposite in this book about Alakine and why he's considered to be one of the founders of the Soviet chess school. And the traits which are similar and logically follow from Chagorin, which are emphasized in this book over and over again, like creativity, uh, breaking the, you know, the exception, finding the exceptions to the rules to create a greater scope for the richness of chess, this kind of artistry, this kind of magic that you know like like town like magic that these attacks okay you might find uh, defensive resources later and and refute these attacks but uh, they created art you know not just uh, for results you know both Shigurin and Alkine after creating works of art from the game and so in terms of russian chess style i get this very different picture of alexander kotov actually this book written in 19 um 70 Free, I think. I'm just going to check. This book 
first published in 1973. So we say we say um, yeah, it's around about the Cold War period. So I, I wonder, you know, this this kind of uh, difference in, in and and uh, Kotov emphasizing he spent many hours himself enjoying and, and analyzing games of Alexander Alekhine. Um So anyway, let's check out this game now. From a rule-breaking uh, perspective, a, a dogmatic tar Tarash perspective. I got the impression actually that Tarash was kind of uh, despised actually by the hypermoderns for trying to restrain the game, simplify it into a set of axioms, you know, like knight before bishop or you know, a set of simplified things. But I don't think Tarash's play was that dogmatic. It's just that his teachings, in order to have more crystal clear teachings, he would often simplify. Um, the game, uh, which which is good for beginners to the game, to be given these crutches to walk on. But later, you, you've got to like lose the crutches. Um, and basically, in in this game, actually, that there are some rules broken by Black, actually. But Alexander's punishing uh, that rule breaking in effect through dynamic play in the opening. Um, so he's able to play dynamically to punish, um, you know, s some of the basic generalizations you'd make about king safety, having to castle, not keeping the king in the centre, not being too greedy in the opening, trying to complete your development. Those basic rules of, of the opening phase were, were broken by Black and it was aggressively punished by Alexander. So let's see how that happened. So d4, d5, and now c4, the queen's gambit, and Black accepts the queen's gambit. And sometimes, you know, this this can be okay for black. Later, white can sometimes get an isolated queen spawn if black strikes with c5 later. But the risk is, you know, white can sometimes have a dangerous um, accelerate de development, uh, capturing on c4 with, with great speed sometimes, and having dangerous play. Uh, and in this game, this this is quite a horrific example of what can go badly wrong if black gets a bit too greedy and neglects development and keeps the king in the center. So knight f6. Okay, e3, going to collect the pawn, and at the same time develop a piece. After e6, bishop takes c4. So black's position is okay, and he's he's aiming thematically, you know, to isolate perhaps the queen the queen's pawn here by playing c5. After castles, he doesn't yet move his bishop on f8. He actually plays knight c6, and this might all be theory. It looks kind of theoretical at the moment. Sorry, knight c6. And then move queen e2, which uh, basically means d1 is available now to the rook. Okay, black plays a6, and now we see knight c3. Now I think here black should continue development, uh, perhaps, or just take on d4, then continue development with bishop e7. I'm not even sure about a6, to be honest. Let's add a bit. So let's just see, has black already gone wrong here? Probably just taking, apparently. Just taking on d4 and then playing bishop e7. And white's got a small advantage, but black can aim to blockade uh, that d pawn and should be okay in this sort of position. But that's not what happened. Um, after queen e2, a6 was played. And after knight c3, again, not developing uh, the king's side. Now, Book actually, in the previous two encounters, to be fair, he drew with Alakai. He's not a bad player. Not a bad player. It's just in this game, he seems to be a bit embarrassed by um, by the opening play in particular. He couldn't uh, get out of the opening alive. So, but after Bishop b3, again, not developing pieces, but instead uh, seeking rather ambitiously, I suppose, to knock out a bit White's central control by dislodging that central uh, knight. Uh, away from these two key squares, but unfortunately, um, white is not forced to move that knight. And another side effect, the weakness of the last move here, b4, is that a4 is now available to white with bishop a4. Um, so the this is noted after d5, first first little surprise actually, because what would happen if black just took the pawn here? Let's add a bit to here. Couldn't black just take the pawn? You might be wondering. So say e takes, knight takes, knight takes, rook d1, and the queen is embarrassed on the d file. And I think 
the problem is, say with knight c e7 is e4, and white's going to get a big advantage. So this would be a bit tricky. Black doesn't want that sort of position. So what he did instead was actually move the knight to a5. And now Alexander used that check and now took on e6. So now, of course, if bishop takes a4, the knight is rescued uh, with knight takes a4 with advantage to white. So f takes e6. But now, with the knight still threatened, Alexander again refuses to move this knight. The rules have been broken by black so far, in that the king is still in the center, and white's mobilized quite a few pieces. I suppose this bishop needs a bit of liberation with e4, though, otherwise the rooks remain unconnected at the moment. Uh, but even so, even with unconnected rooks and these two guys not yet in in the game, Alexander sacrifices, offers a sack of his knight. He plays rook d1, just leaving the knight to be munched. Okay, Black's best, I suspect, is not to take the knight. Actually, let's just check again. Uh, Black's best is probably, okay, actually it's given us taking the knight. <laughs> okay, I was wrong. Let's, let's, let's not use an engine from now on. I've, I've got some notes now from before, prepared earlier. So B takes C3, the knight was munched. So the king's still in the center. Okay, so we're saying this is an example game to show that Alexander was prepared, uh, you know, to think tactically Right, right from the opening, that was one of the three generalization traits. The concrete solution of opening problems. So this, this idea of concreteness. And this is a book written, you know, in 1973. And we're talking about concrete play nowadays, especially with engines. Everything's this argument about being concrete, you know, playing the position, the dynamics. And that, that, that has been a continual argument in, in, in the history of chess you know this this idea of, of static versus dynamic uh, aspects of chess and and you know like the Steinitz Shigurin encounters was like Steinitz was like the positional more the positional player and Shigurin the more dynamic player rule breaking player and Shigurin had a mishap in that match otherwise he might have actually beaten Steinitz and that would have meant his influence as world champion would have been greater I think on the evolution of chess style but later then we see Capablanca against Alakine where Alakine was the victor and then later we see again two two ty opposite types again Karpov Kasparov where Kasparov is the victor. So it seems f from from those set of matches the dynamists have the slight lead there versus the uh, the more positional uh, karma players. But here, okay, so this is dynamism to exploit a kind of rule breaking by Black. The king's still in the center. He plays now rook takes d7 exchange sack, emphasizing the power of this pin now. Um, because now knight e5, a lot of pressure being exerted. Black is forced into con contortions now to defend d7. With these guys out of the game, uh, he has to use the rook resourcefully by playing rook a7. Okay, now white just calmly uh, just plays b takes c3. b takes c3. A quiet move. But what does black do which is constructive in this position now b takes e3 is offered opportunities like rook coming here is offered bishop a3 of course also e4 and queen h5 are on the cards so there's numerous threats to consider and there's numerous defenses possible in this position and here is where it comes to my notes in the game the rather weird looking uh, king e7 was played uh, now, before going into the game continuation of King e7, Queen b8, this is quite, quite interesting how these things are refuted now. If Queen b8, White could take on d7 and play Queen takes a6, and this is dangerous for Black. Now, Black's best move is not what Alexander writes in his notes, which is uh, Queen c7, because this would allow taking on e6 with check and then playing e4, getting this bishop into the game. Uh, with menacing threats, also Bishop F4 to sort of decoy the Queen away from you know D7, because uh, remember we've got the Bishop on D7 as well. So that would be a big advantage uh, to White. But actually here, there's also after Queen A6, there's Queen D6 to consider, because it actually even though it leaves the Knight, it's threatening Queen D1 with a back row mating 
thing. So that's why the knight would be immune here. But even in this position, white's doing very well actually with queen b5. So queen d one's not possible because bishop takes and the rook's being pinned here. So say bishop e7, now e4, and this is really dangerous uh, for black, this position. Um, th this, this is okay, you know, white's got compensation. So e even here, uh, white, white was okay. Uh, once he gets in like bishop e3 to, to solve his back row um, issues, or bishop a3 even, it's, it's okay. The rook would be protecting this and the queen could be a menace again, threatening, really threatening the knight for example. But um, so it gets complicated, so that was the line with queen b8, but there's also say g6. Now here actually queen f3, unsubtly threatening queen f7 mate. So it's preparing that, but bishop a3 now threatening bishop takes c5 to decoy the queen because the knight's pinned away from f7. So say bishop g7, but here knight d7 and rook d1 exploiting that d7 pin, and this is crushing, crushing position. Okay, uh, so there's other possibilities. Say bishop d6, check. This might be okay, this line for black offering the rook. Um, here, even though white's getting this bishop into play, uh, say say bishop e7 um, as well. I mean, th th these lines are okay. Either bishop d6 or bishop e7 seem okay. They end up with the same scenario where the white queen takes there. If we follow it up a little bit here, for example, king f7, e5, it seems this, this would end up logically in a draw by perpetual actually, because white is a piece down, has to be careful. If he doesn't keep up the checks, he could could be in trouble here. So at least he's got a draw guaranteed in this relation. So so that's those two are preferable, I think. Bishop d6 or bishop e7 to what was played. Probably the best defences. But king e7, yeah. This leaves a uh, lots of pinning opportunities now. And the move e4 is played actually, not not worrying about knight takes e5, because now bishop takes g5 will skewer the king and queen. So say knight f6 now. Well this was actually the game continuation, pardon me. Bishop g5, so a nasty pin on f6. This knight can't move back without allowing uh, knight c6. Uh, there's there's lots of threats here. Now, say uh, this was the move chosen, queen c7, and actually here there was a actually a technically crushing move which an engine finds, which is queen h5, which uh, obviously uses that pin and means queen e8 is possible. For example, if queen takes e5, this would be like mating here. This would be a forced mate. This this sequence with queen e8 check. After queen h5, I don't know, actually I haven't explored that many other defences here, but this this is really the, the crushing um, uh, move here, rather than what was played. Bishop f4 was also good, but queen h5, uh, let's just check out just briefly g6. I think g6 is going to fail to something quite simple. Knight takes g6, queen takes h8, f6 is a big problem here, so that's that's the big problem. Okay, okay. So in the game, Alexander played another strong move though. Bishop f4. So he's ke ke keeping an immediate threat. Knight g6 check to win the queen. Queen moves. And now rook d1. Okay. So rook d1 brings another piece into the attack. But you might ask, what are the concrete threats building up? Well, the thing is, the pin off the g6 is now more painful because g6 weakens more f6. So black was trying to get these pieces out, but it's weakened f6, which is now pounced on with bishop g5. This really is a nasty pin now. So now bishop g7, and now the move knight d7. So even though the rook is on d7, this is still a powerful move. Off the rook takes, rook takes, check. And now, in this position, a neat uh, little combination is played. Just taking on f6 and playing e5. Uh, so if the bishop now moves to g7, then queen f3 trivially wins. 
and if the bishop um, moves to uh, e7, I think wherever the bishop moves, it's a total disaster now. e7, probably queen f3. I'm just going to check this. Queen f3 again. And the black king cannot really walk into the discovered check because otherwise rook takes e7 and queen f6 is really nasty. Takes queen f6 is mate actually more than nasty. So this this will be a disaster as well. So in this position, uh, there's not much black can do. Say check rook d1. Black's going to be losing that bishop and with a lost position here. Okay. So after e5, actually, black resigns. So okay, from from a style perspective, we can say that Alexander was quite concrete in the opening, and um, especially with the kings still in the centre, uh, something concrete was need, needed to punish black, and that was actually sacrificing this knight on c3, uh, which which seems like. Uh, you know, quite adventurous, but actually, it is the concrete way to play the position to punish black to get these pins uh, to calmly take on c3. Maybe that's like kind of difficult to play quiet moves in the midst of a sacrificial combination. And there's there's a little bit of peace for a moment here while black sets up another weakness because rook d1 is played, just centralizing, and black creates another like fatal weakness by playing g6 with f6 being really weak but what does black do otherwise he's kind of tied up here if he moves to the knight then knight c6 it's it's very difficult to see what black does here so he played g6 and he walked into this nasty pin with now d7 being a major issue for knight d7 because we've got a coordination of, of these three guys on on d7 so bishop g7 and now knight d7 it breaks down black's defenses really and also liberates the e pawn by playing knight e5. He's just liberated the e pawn, uh, which means this combination now making use of the e pawn is possible. And that's the final like thing. The queen is going to come to f3 decisively, basically, or black's going to have to give up the bishop after queen um, b1 check, rook d1, just giving up the bishop. So it was an interesting game. And so, so really, from a style perspective, um, there, there are a few angles to note about style. The three main Alekhine, um characteristics, which Kotov has emphasised, uh, just to review those again, this game was looking at the third characteristic, so universality of opening repertoire, uh, with black striving for counter-attack, and this third one, the concrete solution of opening problems, a very concrete approach. Okay, but within the evolution of Russian chess style, I'm picking up the idea that chess is an art form creativity, not being limited by rules, uh, celebrating the rule breakers like Chigorin and Anakine shows actually the greater vastness of the game because if the game can be simplified to, to dogma then it stops being so interesting such a fertile ground for art history and the imagination if you can find exception to rules as these two you know fathers of the Soviet school did then you, we're broadening chess we're not simplifying it okay comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much